I consider it a huge privilege to introduce Themis. I've known Themis for 50 years, I think, almost exactly. Um, I first met him working on a rock wall at the Bible college we went to. <clears throat> I, I feel like Themis is my older brother. Um, I consider him sort of the unofficial apostle to our church here at the well and he's given he's been such a bright light and uh, even though we don't talk sometimes for some gaps but when we do I feel like he's always been an anchor steady uh, Themis is very tender and humble, but he's, uh, he's probably one of the most brilliant Greek and Hebrew scholars that I know. But he also has been a man that has very much on his own, many times without a lot of support, um, established and planted uh, more than 30 churches. Change is something. He's... He said to change the subject. So anyway, and let me tell you more about Themis. Uh, I, I got to go to Greece about four years ago, and it let me see in person what it's like to plant churches in difficult places. And uh, so Themis is not only a 
beautiful teacher, but he has moved and lived in the power of God, and God has backed up his ministry. And uh, so I am just so happy to introduce Themis. Give him your attention. Um, Themis, big blessings. Give us whatever you have in your heart. Thank you. Yes, brother. Thank you. Yes, it's good. Do we have some? Thank you. Can we plug this in case I run out? I have a good battery, but. Uh... Is there someone that could find an extension cord? I'll get it. Just in case. It'll stay put, I think. Praise the Lord. It's so good for me to be with you. And see these old faces. <laughs> Amen. You know, I think that when we go to the presence of God, of course, He is the one we need and desire. And the next best thing is going to be the saints. Amen. Amen. Not the angels. The saints. Do you know how much time and effort the Spirit of God has spent to bring you to where you are now? Especially when it comes to ministers. How long does it take for the Spirit of God to move in a person's life and to mature that person and to give him the Father's heart to be settled and quiet in the presence of God and depending on Him. Uh, it take, takes a lot of time. And I've learned to appreciate the people of God, especially those who labor, so that Jesus will get His bride. Amen. Amen. I bring you a lot of greetings from my wife, Joanna, my children. I have one more. Uh, that is Flora, my son's wife, and two granddaughters, Melia and Ellie. They are making my heart beating fast. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I just want to tell you a few, th a few things uh, about the ministry, how it started, because I think it's important when God wants to use you. I remember I was asking questions like, Okay, I finished the school. Now what do I do? Where to go? And how to do it? Because it's one thing to know the theory, but acting on it in the practice is something's very different. Not that we go ever outside of the Word of God. Because that's our foundation. Amen. And we don't move from that. Anyway, so God called me when I was 17 and a half. Actually, my mother dedicated me to the Lord from her womb because she was a born-again Christian. And I grew up in the church. I grew up at our home. We had uh, uh, prayer meetings. And I remember I was three years old walking, and I was looking at the faces of the people praying. And I could see a light. You know, children see things older people don't see. But I remember, I remember my mother, every morning she would uh, kneel down. I was three, three and a half, and I could see the light on her. And that impressed me a lot. But actually the Lord, the Lord called me when I was 17 and a half. And I serve him since. Anyway, I came to the Bible college God spoke to me in 1972 when I was a soldier. It was the first I began to, at first, to hear the voice of God. You know, God speaks. Amen. You believe that? Yeah. People think because uh, there these all these is, Christian institutions, without the Spirit of God, without the witness of God, without the witness of the Scriptures, you know, they... 
pick and choose whatever they will believe. They don't see the whole word of God. And uh, they think because they don't have it, that it's not there. That's a big deception, which started from, even from the second century. Anyway, and um, the Lord filled me with the Holy Spirit in uh, 69, 72, I began to hear the voice of God. And I was shocked. I was scared. But then the Lord continued and continued. And he, his voice began to be the a guiding factor in my life. And I made a promise to the Lord. I said, Lord, you show me your will and I am going to do it by your grace. And that's how I've done so far. Uh, when <clears throat> I was in uh, Athens in 1979, uh, 1980, the Lord began to speak to me to go down to Crete to start, uh, you're going down to Crete, and there I will start my work, the Lord said. Every time I would pray, the Lord would speak that. So, on my own, took my wife, my daughter, she was four at that time, we went down there, and um, I was working hard and evangelizing. Pretty soon our living room was full, and the Lord began to baptize the people in the spirit. We baptized them in the water. Then we went to another building and then to another building. And now we have uh, a building that takes about 400 people in, <clears throat> which we built by ourselves. And by the way, uh, Alex and Darla helped us immensely with that project. And I'm thankful to the Lord. <clears throat> anyway for Alex Monday. So, uh, the Lord began to speak to me to go to places. And everywhere I went, a church would start. Somehow, it's not the same every time, but what I'm trying to say is that I was depending on God's leading, not what I thought. And the church was praying, fasting all the time, and the Lord began to increase the ministry a lot in Greece. Then um, in Cyprus, then in Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, we have uh, lots of churches there. Gypsy churches, we ministered to them. We built five buildings in Bulgaria to house churches there. Thank you, brother. This is what it means to connect to the Spirit of God. <laughs> now you have power. Amen. You cannot have power without the Spirit of God. Jesus said, um, tarry ye in Jerusalem. Brother Scott <laughs> taught me that. Until you be endued with power from on high. Amen. And that's what I want you to understand. I'm sure you do, but... Uh, a second witness, a tenth witness always is welcomed. To move by the power of God and see the results. Not just a theory. Not a religious thing that it's the same over and over and over and over again every year and every other year. No, it's exciting to be led by the Spirit of God. Exciting. Anyway, so uh, we ministered to Turkey, and um, especially in the city of Tarsus, <laughs> or Paul. Yes, we have wonderful brothers. I go there and teach them. And uh, Mersin, also in Turkey, Persian churches in Turkey. Uh, we minister a lot in Kazakhstan. We minister to the Uyghur tribe from which Attila came. Uh, and we have a wonderful a church there that we go every year and we minister and I, we're a team. We're a team. I go with a, a brother from Bulgaria. His name is Adnan and um, he's of Turkish descent, born in Bulgaria, but he's Turkish. So he speaks Turkish and Russian and broken English. And we have another brother. His name is Alexander Goshin 
and he's from Kazakhstan. So he knows English, he knows Turkish, he knows um, Russian. And so everywhere we go, we have interpreters, you know, and we can teach him. It's very, very good. Very, very good. I just uh, loved going out and, um, and ministering to pastors and, and leaders. I established many schools, one in uh, Crete and one in Athens. And from these schools, all our pastors are uh, graduates from th these schools. And also, I taught in nine countries in Africa. And uh, I would gather the pastors there in every locality, like in Nairobi, in, um, <clears throat> that's in Kenya, in um, uh, Eldoret, which is west of Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Congo, Cameroon, and South Sudan. Um, and I ministered to many, 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 many pastors over there for a period of four or five years. I would go two months per year. One month, one time, one month, the other time. And um, also to Johannesburg. The Lord uh, used me there to teach and minister to a lot of people. And I thank him for it. I thank him for it. Um, I visited about 67 countries so far. And everywhere we go, we see the Lord witnessing with miracles, with healings, with extraordinary signs. I will tell you one. We were in India. On, um, in Chennai, now India is like this, uh, on the west coast, on the high plain, there were many, many villages, which means millions of people. You know, there are villages, like every village is like 300,000, 400,000, every village. And I've never seen so many people in my life. Three o'clock in the morning, the streets are full because they don't have money to pay the, the bus. They have to walk distances, and they do it at night because it's cool. Anyway, it, that was a very interesting experience there for me. And um, so a delegation came and from Muslims and Hindus, and they said, we prayed to our God, gods for rain. If it does not rain in eight days, all our crops will be gone and we will starve to death. So, if this Jesus you're preaching is the true God, you pray, and if he brings the rain, we will become Christians. Wow. Wait, if no rain comes, we are going to kill you. <laughs> How do you like that? <laughs> we said, fine. Nope, we take the challenge, no problem. And it was my turn to preach the last day, the last night, I preached, to, so I just said, Lord Jesus, you are the God of heaven and earth, and you love these people. And since they turn to you now, I ask that you open your heaven, no cloud, nothing, and send your rain down. Amen. As soon as I finished, the rain started. When we left, we left 1,200 a church with 1,200 people there. They just came like that. So we had to leave a pastor there to pastor them. Amen. I was, I was in um, South Sudan to the west part of Sudan. It's a city called Mundri. So we were... <laughs> it was very funny. These Africans, you know, they... Uh, so where are we going? Oh, we go to Mundri. Uh, how far is it? It's okay, no problem. We were in the little bus 12 hours. <laughs> and finally he stopped. I said, um, are we here? I mean, yeah, okay, yeah, we're here. So we went over a bridge walking, carrying all our luggage, and then we had to wait two hours 
for the other guys with uh, their motorbikes to come and bring rice and a generator and stuff like that. Okay, now 10 o'clock at night. So um, he says, now what? He says, oh, we have a little to go. I thought, if I guess from what they told me, you know, and I was at the back of the, of the motorcycle, it began to rain. And the brother was freezing to death, so I had to embrace him like this to warm him. And finally, about 12, 12, 30, we arrived in a village. It was dark. I couldn't even see the people. For reasons you understand why. <laughs> I could only see. <laughs> Everybody was smiling. So I says, brother, here, you're going to sleep here. So I said, I couldn't see anything. It was like darkness. So he got me from here, says, stoop down, 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 down. I went down. I, we got into this little hut, you know. And he opened a small light, uh, you know, this flashlight. And he said, this is your bed. So I looked at my bed, and I thought, it was going like this, down, and like oh, that. Goodness. OK. <laughs> I slept. Uh, in the morning, I was kind of crooked, but <laughs> I slept. In that city, the first, the second day, the power of God came so strong on everybody that they began to call all the dignitaries of the city. The mayor came, the chief of the police, uh, other dignitaries, and CEOs, they came. And I prayed for them. God healed them right on the spot. They saw the power of God on them. And immediately a church was born there. So we had to leave people there to, to minister to them. Anyway, so oh, I can spend all the time talking to you about this, but that's not um, what is in my heart. You know, Jamie, he, he talked too much about me. <clears throat> I am just a sinner saved by grace. I live every day broken at the feet of Jesus because uh, every time when my phone rings, it's not because they tell you something beautiful and good. And they, What do you hear? Jamie, what do you hear when your phone rings? Help! Pastor! This and that! And not just one church. You know, many churches, many places. And unless you're filled with the presence of God, Unless you surrender everything, you don't carry it on you, it will kill you. You surrender it to Jesus so you can live. You, are, you ought to live the way God wants you to live. And ministering is not an excuse. No. It's his ministry. You're just a servant. And I've learned to leave everything at his feet and live like a child. I am, I am like a child. I'm not complicated. I just love the Lord, and I want to do his will. And God always will honor every heart that opens. He will honor. And God honored me. And I thank him, and I give him all the glory. I have a question. <clears throat> Why Jesus died on the cross? For our sins, okay, fine, he did that. Our sins are forgiven, good. Then what? To, okay, he's give, he gives, gives us life. Then what? Why? You see, to forgive our sins is not the main goal of the Spirit of God. Your sins are forgiven so that what God had in mind for you to be accomplished. What did you have in mind? Amen. To fill us with himself. To fill us with his, the most precious commodity in the universe, which is the Spirit of God. Amen. The Spirit of God is not another God or another person. The Spirit of God is God's self, God's being. That's who he is. God is spirit. And 
All the goodness and the beauty and the glory and the power are given in the Spirit of God. So unless you have it, you have just a nominal Christianity. That's all you have. Whatever that means. No. Jesus said, the verse I quoted in the beginning, don't go out yet, his disciples. Stay in Jerusalem until, until. How many of us want to be used of God? Okay. Do you have the power of the Spirit of God? And God is not a respecter of persons. He loves you the same way he loved his son. In fact, Jesus said, the, the way the Father loved me, so I love you. So what do you have? The love of the Father. Amen. And God desires that wait until you be endued with power from on high. And I stand here as a witness because I knew nothing about nothing. And God filled me with his word. He filled me with his spirit. And I began to see the power of God expressed. I was in Bogota, and along with other ministers, in the church of Caesar Castellanos. I don't know if you've heard him. Anyway, so we were going up the stairs to find a place to, for the pastors to eat. On the second floor, our driver, who was responsible to drive us around back and forth in the hotel, he brought his aunt, a young woman, like 30, 35 years old. And she was um, struck from, uh, from polio since she was nine, and her left leg was six centimeters shorter than the other. And she was wearing uh, a prostate so she could walk straight. And he comes to me. I mean, there were a lot of people. He came to me and says, um, Brother, I brought you my aunt. I want you to pray for God to heal her leg. What's the problem? What's the problem? He said, um, from polio. It's six, year, six uh, centimeters shorter. Said, okay. Now, what would you do if I mean, it's from polio? It's not because something is crooked and... No, it's polio. What's the first thought? Hmm? <laughs> Wrong. So you have to take that away. It's not you. Nobody's asking you to heal somebody because you can't. You cannot. It's the Spirit of God through you that will do the job. And to God is no, nothing big or small. Nothing. I mean, he commands everything and he obeys. So I, with that faith, I said, okay. I make her, made her sit on a chair and I saw the prostate there on her left leg. So I, I asked her to put her uh, hands on her knees. I put my hands on hers, and I commanded that leg to, to grow out in Jesus' name. Suddenly, she began to scream, and her uh, leg went, ah, like this, came out. And suddenly, I saw it had the prostate. So I saw the left leg out, about 600 meters. And I forgot that she had the prostate. And I thought, my God, now what we do? <laughs> and then I remembered, oh, she's wearing the prostate. So she <laughs> took them off. She began to dance all over. And you know, the first thing she did, she went and bought a, a nice pair of shoes with high heels. <laughs> and she was walking. Now, everybody in her neighbor, uh, they knew her since she was nine. So she, she was going like this, everybody. Guess what? She walked all over, and they be, she began to tell the miracle. And at Saturday night, 1,200 people came and gave their heart to the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's the power. Yeah. Not yours, not mine. It's his. 
And all God wants is that you open. Believe him that he's faithful and pray and the power of God will manifest itself. Amen. So I've seen, I was in India and um, we preached a huge crowd. I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands were. Huge. And um, we asked the people to give their heart to Jesus. They came. And then we were like three ministers, uh, myself, a German, and then Indian brother, a Hindu brother. Um, and we said, now, if you are sick, please come. We'll pray over you. And a woman comes with a, a three-year-old girl. She was the first one. And the left eye, the pupil, it was white. She could not see. So she says, now Indian people believe. And they're open like that. She said, Pastor, I gave my heart to the Lord. And now I want him to heal my child. Do you have that kind of faith? Do you? Yeah. Well, they did. She did. So all I did, I just put my hand there, and I said, in Jesus' name, I command healing on this eye, and 100% uh, uh, vision. <clears throat> so my interpreter said, okay, let's check. Um, and we covered the right eye, and he said, how many are these? And the girl goes like that. How many are these? Go like this. And I said, uh, he said, dear, the Lord heal your, your daughter. And she goes, you know, the Hindus, they move <laughs> their head like an elephant. Like this. And so simply God moved. I mean, no earth shaking. And God was doing Wonderful, and he's doing wonderful things. Amen. Amen. Um, another area that I had to grow in these because I had no raw example before me to follow. It was like God thrust you in the sea and says, swim. I don't know. Swim, you know. <laughs> Some dads do this, do this to their sons. Anyway, so I didn't know what apostolic ministry is. I never called myself apostle. Uh, I don't even ever anywhere you will see apostle so and so. You know, no. God doesn't want us to do that. Now, if we have to use our authority, yes, like Paul says. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's talking to the church, and they, he wants them to know uh, the angle in which he's writing. He's writing as a sent out one, as a one who has been sent out. That's apostolos means, to send out. Apostello is the Greek word. Anyway, and one area that I had to learn is how to help people grow. That was the most difficult lesson for me. Because people come the way they are. You know, yes, their sins are forgiven. They are baptized, baptized with the Holy Spirit. But there is a character inside. A character. Things that um, happen in your life, and you have to make conscious decisions which formed your consciousness and your whole being, your character, your reactions. And, you know, the real fight that we have inside with the Spirit of God is character. The character. Character. It's a Greek word, by the way. <laughs> character. It means the imprint. In Hebrews 1, 4, it says, Christ is the character of God, the visible of the invisible God, the image of the invisible God. The character, the real you, 
The Spirit of God has to work in there, and the more you allow him, the more the Spirit of God will bring from within. No one knows the depths of God but the, uh, the Spirit of God. No one knows the depths of man but the Spirit of a man. Our spirit knows our depths. That's why he filled us with the spirit to give us, give the ability to our spirit to bring perfect prayers to God without our mind being um, 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 interfering. And um, Paul says, when I pray in the spirit, he says, I will pray with the spirit, I will pray with the understanding. Now, Many champion. We are the uh, continuation of the apostolic anointing and this and that. Okay. Do you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you speak in tongues? Do you have the uh, tangible, um, uh, the tangible uh, evidence. evidence of God's anointing? Of the Spirit of God? No. In fact, they will call you... Uh, devil because you speak in tongues. Yeah. So, our continuation with the apostles has a sign, a seal that no man can imitate, no man can uh, manipulate, and that is the living presence of God in you. Individually, as a church, as groups of churches, or as a true church all over the world. The Spirit of God wants to take care of your character. That's why he has given us the prayer of the Spirit. Our spirit knows the depths of ourselves. What's going on? We don't know that with our mind. And it can form perfect prayer to God. So that your character will change. You know, a good analogy to understand. Uh, how to use the gifts of God with a character. A good analogy is... Have you seen the sailboats? The tall sail? Well, what do you need under the boat to um, the keel? I mean, uh, you see, you need another power to hold when the wind blows that big sail. And you have to, you have to go deep so the boat can stay. Well, many, many Christians, they love the gifts. Oh, the power. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay. We want the power. What else is needed for the power of God to be sustained on you? To have good fruit in your life. The keel. That's the character. That's having the spirit of Christ in you. Do you know that no gift is operated except through the spirit of Christ? The gifts are operating only in as much as you have the character of Christ in you. That's why we see people, oh, they prophesy, oh, wonderful, but their life is miserable. There's no holiness, no purity, no sacrifice, nothing. And yet, they want to... Of course, you're going to have false prophets and false teachers. Peter prophesied about it. That they will be. Why? Because people, they tend to want the show and not the depths of Christ in them. You know, the Lord opened this subject to me in a magnificent way. And I thank him for it. Every day I worship him for it. See, I, I'm going to give you just a little bit. <clears throat> the scripture says, in fact, this question, I, I was in Australia a few weeks ago in Sydney, and I talked with a man who is responsible of 
all the churches of the aboriginals in Australia. A wonderful man. Wonderful man. I, very seldom I met mature people like that. And the Lord anointed me, and I began to open my mouth, and I began to talk to him about Jesus. His relationship with the Father, the Spirit, and all this. And uh, it was so strong, so powerful. And she says, hmm, you're right. That's what it is. But I have a question. How about Philippians 2.5? I said, he says, he's being equal with God. I said, okay, let's use the hermeneutics a little bit. Look at the context. For whom is he talking about? Let the same mind be in you as it was in Christ Jesus. He's not talking about a pre-existent person of God. He's talking about when Christ was down here. What is the mind of uh, thinking uh, the other people more important than you? Just uh, to humble yourself. And that's what Jesus did and gives us his example. Who being in the form of God, form, hey, God does not have a form. He's spirit. You agree with that? Yes. Moses said, be careful because you have not seen any form of God. Lest you deceive yourself and you make an image. God does not have a form because he's spirit. The spirit is unseen. It's like the wind, like the breath. It's unseen. That's what the spirit is. And thought it not robbery to be equal with God. When Jesus was down here, all the fullness was in him. The Father was in him. He confessed it many times. The works that I do, I don't do of myself. The Father who... Meno. It's the verb. To dwell. The Father who is permanently dwelling in me, he does the works. He does the works. So, um, he thought it not robbery. Actually, the Greek text says, he thought it not of something to snatch it for himself. Jesus, that's what I wanted to tell you. Jesus never used the position that he received from the Father. He never used the fullness that the Father gave him. He never used the powers of deity that he was invested with for himself. People came to get the taxes for the temple. It was Jesus and Peter. And Jesus had no money. He had no money. Shall I say it again? Because I don't know what they're preaching, but this Jesus had no money in his pocket. Oh, he could have. And whatever he had, it was for the other people. That's the heart of the minister. You're not here to get, you're here to give, first of all, your whole life, a living sacrifice. Anyway, so Jesus said, throw your hook, and the first fish you catch, you will find a, a stutter. Stutter, a two didrachma, two, um, uh, the portion for every Israelite, it was one, uh, like two drachmas, two drachmas. And two and two, four, makes us a stutter. He could have said, could have said, okay, you get a big fish, and it's going to be full of diamonds and gold, and, you know, so we can never use, never use the power. Never. Just for the need. That's how he taught us to pray. Give us our daily bread. Daily bread. Don't pray foolishly. 
Some of the prayers are not answered because they're not uh, uh, done according to the will of God. That's the Jesus I believe. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, um, the Lord gave me, I, I felt like he gave me wisdom, understanding how to deal in his house, how to help God's people. And now we have a body of ministers from many nations that they are taught the same faith. They are walking the walk of Christ. They are filled with the same spirit and they teach the same things. And my vision, and I say this and I'm, I'm finishing this session, um, <clears throat> my vision, that's where my heart beats fast, is what Jesus <laughs> desired and he expressed it in his prayer in John 17. He said that they may be one. Paul adds and says that God has given five ministries. Five, like the fingers of the hand. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. For the edification or the equipping of the saints. So that the saints, you know, when I came to the army, I was, you know, like a jello. And I, they had to make me a soldier. And then they had to give me all the weapon and the knife, everything. Equipping. These five ministries are to equip the body of Christ that the body of Christ will do the work of the ministry. People think, well, the pastor this and the pastor that and the pastor that. No, no, no. The pastor and everyone, every minister is to equip you so that you can go out and do the will of God. People come and say, Pastor, what shall I do? What God wants me to do? Go out, win souls, open your living room and fill it with people. God will fill it with people. That's how you start. That's how I started. I mean, if you really love souls, this is what you will, uh, uh, be, you will be doing. Um, the fivefold ministry, you know, it was destroyed by the time Constantine came to power, the emperor. He destroyed the apostolic structure of the church completely and raised up big bishops. They separated the, the word bishop is episcopos in the Greek and from the elders, presbyters. In the Bible, they are used interchangeably. The bishops are the elders and the elders are bishops. Not all bishops have the same ministry. That's why he says, he said in the church, some first, First, apostles. Secondary, prophets. Thirdly, teachers, meaning pastors and teachers. They are together. Every pastor must teach. Every teacher is not a pastor. Got that? Okay. So, for every one of these ministries, God gave a special anointing. A special anointing that they will be able to fulfill the role, the, the work that is demanded from that ministry. By 300, the five ministries were almost gone. And when the Roman emperor became the Maximus Pontifex of the church, meaning the great bridge maker, the great mediator. All the gifts were gone. It became Constantine's church, the Catholic church. They allowed the church to be used by the politicians. And the politicians, they love to 
grab power wherever they see it for themselves. And that's exactly what happened. And what happened? Look at history. We go down to the Dark Ages, and then um, through the uh, Renaissance, you know, through the um, Reformation, thank you. Through the Reformation, we see God is drawing people out and drawing. And from then, drawing again. Why? They began to see it, the truth and little by little by little by little. And every time they saw something, they separated themselves. They saw something else, they made it another group. You know, the word of God is a knife. It's a sword. Of course it's going to cut. People say, well, there are so many pieces. Yes, because when you have people that do not care about truth and people that care about the truth, that knife, that sword is going to cut and separate. It will separate the flesh from the spirit. And that's what the, the true history of the church is that way. And God's desire is and was to bring his people back to the apostolic uh, structure of the church. And now, you see, God is bringing back pastors, prophets, and the last the last gift to be restored is the apostolic. Now I can hear. I was in Boston ministering to a Dominican church from uh, Dominican Republic. Very good brothers. And the pastor said, I want you to come with me to New York so we can talk to the other apostles of our churches. I'd be glad to. I would be glad to. So there's a movement of unity. From first, we have the unity of the spirit. We need to keep that. Okay? We need to continue on that until we all come to the unity of the faith, which is the hardest part. I was asking, Lord, how are you going to do it? I mean... We are on the threshold. You can see the seven head is here. They are ruling on every uh, government. They said, you do this and nobody can say no. Nobody. You saw that with COVID and all the laws. It was illegal. It was illegal. You imagine you have people that are illegal in authority making their word legal, right. illegally. Right. That's exactly what is happening. It's happening. Why do you think it's, it's called lawlessness? The environment for the Antichrist to come is lawlessness. Yeah. And we see that. Yeah. They are push it, pushing it everywhere. You know in how many ways I don't want to get into that because I get really agitated. Anyway, and uh, um, the gifts are given. Yeah, I was talking about this Dominican brother. You know, God wants his church to be one. He will make it one. And I was asking the Lord, Lord, how are you going to do it? We are almost there. And the Lord just showed me. When you take... Okay, let's go back to the time of the apostles. Let's not talk about us. But if you have Peter, John, James, Paul, Barnabas, agree together, will the church have any problem? No. It's not that the, the crowds of God's people will have to agree. They will agree as long as their leadership leads them to it. So the Lord showed me that he will connect apostles and prophets together to create the headship of the church. The headship, that's how God worked. 
the headship of the church, and the whole body will follow. That it can happen in one day, like Isaiah 66 says. Yes, practically in one day. That fast is going to happen. And then that body, this one body with one Lord, one spirit, one baptism, one faith, will preach the gospel to all the world in a very short time. In a very short time. When people agree and they speak the same thing, no matter where you are, the power is immense. And God will be able to do very quickly what has not been done for so many ages. Amen. So, I was saying about the anointing. What is the anointing, by the way? Have you wondered? What is it? Is it like a magical thing? That, an oil? Because the Orthodox and the Catholics, they... They change the Holy Spirit to oil. Well, it's the Old Testament. What Old Testament? These were types and shadows. Now we have the real thing. What is the Holy Spirit? It's not an oil. Yes, we can take types from the oil. You needed five ingredients to make the anointing oil. And only kings and priests would be anointed. Do we have kings and priests here? Yes. Amen. Amen. Oil, olive oil, cinnamon, cassia, uh, calamus, aromatic calamus, reed, and smyrna. Why did he choose these? You see, the oil, to get the oil, it's a process of beating the tree. You have to beat, I know, I have 21 olive trees in my yard. I get my own olives. I've seen the process over and over and over again. You beat the olives, they come down, you take them to the oil press, and they are squeezed. squeezed. They became like a paste. And then a process of separation happened. And the oil is separated, then they take it through a, a hot, uh, hot water tank, and they throw this paste underneath, and the oil, which is lighter, goes to the top. The other, which is water-based, it goes down. Does that tell you something? Yeah. Welcome to the anointing process. Okay, cinnamon. You have to... Cut and strip the bark of the tree like this. The flesh. And when you allow the Lord to strip the flesh from you, that's one ingredient, ingredient of the anointing. A sweet smell to God. Acacia is you go deep in the heart of the tree and you take the heart out. That's a deeper Giving and cleansing and surrendering. Do you want the anointing? Yeah, but you have to go through the process. And Smyrna was a balm for the dead. You know, Smyrna, they would nick the bark and tears will come out. Tears. And that's Smyrna. You're going to have to shed a lot of tears. A lot of tears. For many reasons. And that means God prepares your heart for the anointing to come. Anointing is the abilities that God is giving you. Virtues and understanding needed for you to finish the work that God is giving you to do. Amen. It's not your mind. It's not your philosophical knowledge, this and that, or your learning. I remember Ralph. <laughs> he was talking about the book learning. <laughs> no, it's not. God anointed shepherds. 
They knew nothing. I mean, Amos was a sycamore gatherer and a shepherd. Don't let that scare you. When God will anoint you, you will see the power and the glory of God manifest. So when it comes for ministers, all I want to see is God choosing them, witnessing for them. I don't care if they know or they don't know. And we have people, very simple people, not much learning, but full of wisdom and the power of God. Amen. And in the churches, they have learned people, doctors and lawyers, and they give the word of God out, and they receive everything God gives them. So, there's an anointing with the apostle. There's a, another anointing with the prophet. Another anointing with pastor and teacher. And another evangelist also. We have people, evangelists, pure evangelists. I cannot do that. They just, they go to the supermarket and they begin to evangelize people just like that. You open their mouth, poo, there it is. My wife, my wife used to do that a lot. So she would open and get the discussion. Then, famous come, <laughs> talk to them. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. It's anointing in the lives of the people. By the anointing, we will break the yoke. You need to seek God in that vein, in that direction. Lord, I want your power, your glory, not to lift up myself, not to show to them who I am and how much I know. No, no, no. Forget it. If you have that kind of spirit, you have to die to yourself first. Go to the uh, cinnamon and the um, cassia process. <laughs> you know? um, so all this can come out. And then, through the Spirit of God, the Lord is the Lord in the church and he's directing his people. He's directing the work. It's not the pastor. You don't look to men. Men are anointed. They do exactly what God tells them to do as long as they are connected. What is the most important thing for you to see in your pastor or in your leader? What is the most important? What makes you feel safe? If he's connected with God, if the Spirit of God is on him, if he, the power of God is on him, and the wisdom of the Spirit of God is on his shoulders. Amen. And God requires you then to submit. Let me give you one more thing. The Lord gave me this when we were coming with uh, Brother Jeff today. Many people think the church is democracy. Now, I am a Democrat. I mean, if Greece, no, I don't even know what a Democrat and a Republican is. But uh, meaning, I love democracy. What does democracy mean? It's a Greek word again, demokratia. It means the people hold the power. Demokratia is okay for the world. Because in the world, you have believers and unbelievers together. So the, there has to be some restriction to protect each and every individual so that they can enjoy their freedom. You have believers and unbelievers. But the church is not democracy, brothers. It's theocracy. What does that mean? God has the authority and the power in his church. And he shows you his style, how he moved all these thousands of years till now. He wanted to get the people out of Egypt. He didn't call a committee. In fact, the committee wanted to stone Moses. And usually, if you have churches like this, that's what they do. They stone 
What, what did he call? He called one man, Moses. Kept him in the wilderness, 40 years. And God sent him to bring the people out. One man. When he was in the wilderness, a lot of problems, difficulties, he was fighting all by himself. God said, separate seven elders. Listen to this. And God says, I will take from the spirit which is in you. That's a principle there. And Moses, he did not want a, a party of opposition like a democracy. We have this party, which is for that government, and the other party, what do they do? They are against the government. They want to throw them down so they can be in power. But the church, brethren, is not like that. It's for people who do not agree. They are the worldly people. In the church, we all have, must have one mind. Whose mind? The mind of Christ. Okay, so God chose a Moses. Set him in front. And he tells Moses, choose seven elders. And I will take from the spirit which is in you. That means the spirit of God mixed with the pastor's spirit. His goals, his desires, what he wants to do. It's, it's the, the, the seal of the spirit that will come to the elders. When someone is uh, ordained an elder, he doesn't get an independent spirit all by himself. And he can go to the pastor and say, Pastor, I don't think this is right. And you, that's what you should do. And then they become a Jezebel in the church. I've seen that because I've seen it in many, many churches, not anywhere else, in our midst. People have the wrong idea. When God, when God calls someone to lead, the people around him, they must be given to the same vision and to help and strengthen their pastor or leader, whoever he is. They have to have the same heart, the same mind. So they can help their brother and not make his life difficult and make, make him so that he will not be able to sleep at night. Because instead of brothers, he has enemies, dogs. This dogs equals um, bad leaders, bad workers. Jesus talks about dogs. He talks about the bulls of Bashan surrounded me. Who were they? They were ministers with great strength, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And they used their strength to fight Jesus. Please don't do that. You don't know what kind of curses you receive. Now, I'm not saying that if you see something wrong, you will not be able to to have the freedom to say, well, Jamie, you know, I think this and that. What do you think about this? You give it to him and pray. God doesn't want Jezebels. You know what Jezebel means? Ishbaal means without a husband, without authority. Persons that are in the church, but they rule themselves, and they want to rule everybody else. I had people come to church and say, uh, what you're doing is wrong. I, I will tell you what you will do. Said, okay, okay, I'll listen to you. Come on, tell me. Horrible. Demonized people. And we need to fight this with everything we've got. You know why? Because with the bride of Christ, we have the church of Laodicea. We have the uh, Philadelphia church, which is a Church of brotherly love, but friendship love. Philia, phileo, friendship. They're friends. Brothers become friends. You, you know, you can choose. You cannot choose your brothers. Can you? 
<laughs> no. Mommy and daddy decide to have another child and you're stuck. That's it. <laughs> it might be the worst person in the world, but it's your brother or your sister. But you can choose your friends. Friends, they stick together. They help each other. They stand uh, against anything together because they're good friends. That's why God is calling his bride Philadelphia. Brothers who are bond, bonded with the bond of friendship before God. Amen. What is the next church? Laodicea. Laodicea. It means the people rule. Hello? Democracy. Now I have my say. I will tell you what to do. I don't agree with you. And if you have a body like this, you know what I would do? I said, okay, stay. I go somewhere else. Thank you. That's it. God told Moses, I can raise another nation from you. Because that's what they were doing. They were not obeying. They were not submitting. So they stayed in the wilderness. And a lot of people, believe me, a lot of people, churches, will stay in the wilderness of uh, the tribulation period. So we don't want to become that. We need to humble ourselves. I love it when God gives me leading, you know, and then before I just say anything, people come to me and say, Pastor, you know, the Lord showed me this dream. Oh, I had this vision. I had the, this word from the Lord. The same. There, there will be always a good witness from the Spirit of God. Amen. Uh, can we make a little break here? Okay. And then we'll go into the dreams and visions. How many of you know how to interpret your dreams? Hmm. Okay, we're going to learn things in the, in the time we have. I want to give you the best I feel that you need in the area of dreams and visions and prophecy as well. Okay, let's have a break. It is 10.30. Um, let's make it like a 10 to 12 minute break. So we'll be back. Uh, so do your business. If the bathrooms seem too full, you can go right across the street real quick and drain the radiator and come right back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>